uh, happy that Howard is uh, a leader of, of this amazing weekend and event. And I'm also a civil rights attorney with the Justice Department. Um, and I've been there for the last uh, over a decade, uh, working on trying to uh, help bring uh, equal protection under the laws to all Americans. And um, I'll get into my inspiration for, for writing the book in a minute, but I think that the role that all of you guys have as teachers is just so incredibly important to creating future leaders who understand their civic responsibility and um, understand you know, how and what we need to do to fulfill the, the promise of what's the best of America. And so I'm really grateful and humbled to, uh, to be here with all of you. And so I'd wanna to turn to the amazing illustrator of Black Was the Ink, Justin Johnson, to introduce himself. Uh, hello all, um, good morning. Um, also excited to be here. I am a recent graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I am currently and have been a teacher in, DC, in DCPS for about two or three years and previously taught um, at charter schools in DC. And so I'm excited to um, be here and I'm also excited to even find myself in this opportunity because um, Michelle reached out um, to my agent and um, wanted me to actually work on this project. And I was excited to even be given this opportunity as well as like, this is my first illustration job, really um, publishing job. So I was excited um, to even get the opportunity. And I find myself back home, which is very ironic, but also very related to the book as a whole. So. Uh, I want to send it back to Michelle, um, <laughs> who's going to start with the presentation. Um, and I know you guys will be excited for it. You're muted, Michelle. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to learn the difference between mute and un unmute. <laughs> But I, I hope that this will be a very interactive session and I have lots of questions built in so please don't be shy. Um, and, and if you have an answer, feel free to raise your hand and, um, and I can call on you or if you'd like to put responses in the chat that's that would be great as well. And I'd like to start just talking about the cover of Black Was the Ink. And I was wondering, does anyone have any impressions of what this book may be about just based on looking at the cover? Deborah, if you see any um, hand raises, could you let me know? I, I might miss them. Does anyone have any thoughts or can anyone tell me anything they see on the cover? Anything they recognize? Any images? Well, I see the capital, um, so I'm assuming maybe there's something about uh, Black um, representatives and senators elected after, during Reconstruction. Yes, very good. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. That's a perfect response. Uh, so there's definitely the U.S. Capitol in the background. And there's one other thing that, um, that I'm going to point out. If you notice that there's an open book on uh, behind the main character, and the main character, his name is Malcolm. He is a teenager, uh, African-American teenager from the D.C., from D.C., and, um, and so he's kind of looking backwards at the Capitol, out the corner of his eyes, and behind him is a book. And flowing out of the book are pages that actually form a thought cloud around uh, his head. And those pages are from the diary of his ancestor that he finds. He finds this diary when he's visiting his family's farm in Mississippi. And those pages and that ancestor is what allows him to take this magical journey into the reconstruction era. Let me see. 
see if I can. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my inspiration for writing Black Was the Ink. And the inspiration was the Mother Emanuel massacre that occurred in the summer, June of uh, 2015. And like so many people around the country and the world, I was absolutely horrified um, by what took place. And one of the things that stood out to me was how young the assassin and the, you know, the, the person who committed the murders uh, was. And he was only 19 years old at, at the time. And so he was very, you know, recently had been in high school himself. Um, and what was so astounding to me is how a person so young could be filled with so much hatred that they would go into a place of worship and take the lives of people that had that he didn't know and that had never harmed him. And so I was I was struck and I was wondering what who was filling this this you know, horrible information in his head. And what uh, counter information could he have had access to that would have helped expand his understanding of what it means to be an American? And, um, and when I looked into the history of the church, a couple of things uh, jumped out. One, I found out, and I did not know any of this before the massacre, sadly, I should have, because it's such a historic um, church, but it was founded by a man named Denmark Vesey. And if his name is familiar to, to any of you guys, he was the leader of one of the largest attempted slave revolts um, that, that took place in 1822. Uh, and he actually founded the Mother Emanuel Church. It went by a different name at the time of its founding, but it was the same congregation. He founded that church in 1818. Um, the attempted slave revolt was discovered, and he, along with all of his co-conspirators, um, were executed. Um, and the, the Charleston area passed an ordinance that um, said that enslaved people could no longer practice their faith and their religion because they realized they were using the church as a, uh, a vehicle to organize resistance to oppression and their resistance to slavery. Um, but the church congregants continued to meet underground and in secret all the way up until the end of the Civil War. Um, and when the Civil War ended and Black people finally obtained their freedom, uh, one of the first things these congregants did was they built a brick and mortar church for the very first time. And um, very interestingly, the architect of their first church was a man named Robert Bessie, who was a descendant of Denmark Bessie. Another thing that I learned was during the Reconstruction era, the head pastor of the Mother Emanuel Church was a man named Richard uh, Daddy. He went by Daddy, but Richard Daddy Kane. And not only was he the head pastor of the church, he was also one of the first Black members of Congress. And during the 1870s, there were 16 uh, different Black members of Congress that all came from Southern states, and uh, Richard Daddy Kane was one of them. Um, another thing that I learned was that the church continued to play an active role in the fight for liberation and, and full equality of rights for Black people, um, in that Booker T. Washington spoke at the church, and Coretta Scott King led a march um, uh, in, in uh in support of striking workers from the church's step. And she was actually met with bayonet wielding members of South Carolina's National Guard all the way up until 2015 when this massacre took place. And again, the head pastor of the church, Mr. Uh, Clementa Pinckney, was also a sitting South Carolina state senator. And, um, and, and when I learned all of this, um, I began to see the church as sort of an example of a through line of American history that connects us today in our present all the way back to slavery and all of the different efforts that have taken place in, in these years since to try to bring full equal rights to all American citizens. Um, and another inspiration uh, was just thinking about the young people and thinking about the young people who have become so vocal in their demands for change and equality. And so that's how I came up with the concept of the main character Malcolm as a young teenage African American um, boy who um, initially at the beginning of the story, it feels pretty um, 
uh, hopeless about the state of affairs of being Black in America, but through learning about a history that he, that was never taught to him in schools, he begins to feel empowered and motivated and wants to be a part of his, his ancestors' um, uh, continuous fight for, for change. So one of the things that I like to talk about when I, you know, open this discussion is, um, is, is thinking about what makes America unique in the world. And, and I mean in the good ways, because I think there are a lot of really wonderful things at the time of our country's founding that, um, you know, made us stand out and uh, serve as a beacon of hope for people all around the world. And so um, if you guys could indulge me in, a, in an activity for a few minutes, um, could you either raise your hands or write in the chat, what are some things about American governance that really make us, um, um, you know, at least unique at our founding? I know a lot of countries now have a lot of these same norms, but at our founding, what are some, some words, some principles that uh, you associate with America? Deborah, can you help me uh, just if there are any responses in the chat or if anyone's raising their hands? I can't see very much with the PowerPoint open. Sure, I can read some of them if you like aloud. Um, uh, and I think some of these are aspirational, I'm assuming. Um, one man, one vote, separation of powers, freedom of the press, we the people, focus on individual liberties, democracy, uh, uh, meritocracy, question mark, uh, <laughs> rights, freedom of speech, uh, republicanism, racism and white supremacy, separation of church and state. Um, I would add the sale of human beings and sale of children away from their families. Yes. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. We, we hit on a ton of those. And again, right now, I'm just trying to focus on the positive attributes of America, but yes, yeah, so we, you guys, your responses hit on so many of those. And these are some of the ones that I thought of that are not at all, um, uh, you know, it's not a conclusive list. Um, but we, we believe in consent of the governed, right? We get to choose um, who represents us and who makes our laws. We don't have kings here. Um, we believe in the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, due process under the law. People are entitled to a jury of one's peers, equal justice, no taxation without representation. So I, you know, I know that's sensitive for, for folks in DC in particular. Um, innocent until proven guilty, no man's above the law, and all men are created equal. And so this is, this is what America um, presents itself as to the world. And this is, you know, these are all things that are found in our founding documents. But it's always important to remember that none of these principles applied to the millions of African Americans um, that, that were enslaved in this country, um, as well as, you know, other groups as well to, you know, to different degrees, but that's, it's a really important point. And so at the end of the Civil War, can anyone guess how many uh, people of African descent, and Deborah, you're not allowed to guess on this one, because I think you're going to know all these answers, <laughs> but can anyone guess about how many people of African descent were freed from slavery at the end of the Civil War? A hundred. Did you say a hundred? Yes. Okay, any other guesses? Are there any uh, responses, Deborah? Uh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, we got 4.5 million, 4 million. Um, uh, let's see. It's okay. Correct. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was right around 4.4 million people and that's a lot more than 100 <laughs> but it's a it's a huge um number of people that had never um been able to participate in any of the founding principles of american governments they had never you know had the ability to uh offer their consent to the rules that governed them they uh, had no they were not entitled to a jury of their peers if they were accused of anything they were treated as property um, but after the civil war 
uh, debate took place in, in our country of what to do with these 4.4 million people that were predominantly located in the South and in many of the Southern states um, made up half of the, the Southern states population. So here you had half of the state's population that had no say in government, um, had never voted for anyone, had no representation in the government. And so there were a lot of people that thought the, the best course of action would be to just deport them, um, to find another country, to send them to, ship them off. Um, and so that was that was considered by President Lincoln and by President Grant and different you know, presidents really give, gave this a lot of thought and explored um, the possibility of doing that. But at the end of the day, the side of the argument that won out was these people are here and they should have the rights of citizenship. Um, that's, that's where Congress landed. And with that, Congress passed a series of amendments to the United States Constitution known as the Reconstruction Amendments, which for the very first time uh, gave people of African descent the rights of citizenship. And I just want to point out this picture here. It's one of the many beautiful illustrations in the book done by Justin. Um, and any, any guesses? what this is a picture of. And I'm gonna to turn to you again, Deborah, sorry. Yes, uh, we have um, uh, teacher Aaron um, guest uh, Hiram Revels in the Senate. Wow, nice, wonderful, thank you. So yes, yeah, this is a picture of uh, United States Senator Hiram Revels, uh, who represented the state of Mississippi in the Reconstruction era. And he is the very first African-American um, member of Congress. And, and, and so he was a US Senator. Um, okay, so Congress passed a series of three uh, amendments in this period. The first was the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, except for those duly convicted of a crime. And that exception ended up being big enough to drive a truck through. But the intention was uh, to abolish slavery. And, um, and it, you know, largely had that effect in the, you know, when it was first passed. Uh, the second amendment passed in this period was the 14th Amendment that granted U.S. citizenship rights to all people born or nationalized in the United States. And so that means if you're a U.S. citizen and you're born or naturalized here, you are entitled to due process under the law and equal protection under the law. And the third of the amendments is the 15th Amendment, and it prohibited states um, from denying or abridging citizens' rights to vote on, the count, on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So taken together, these three Reconstruction Amendments radically transformed um, the American system of governments. And it, in, um, and it took all of those principles that we had at the very beginning at our founding, and it actually made them apply more universally to all Americans. And I, you know, I still have to caveat it and say more universally because obviously women, um, you know, did not get the right to vote at this time, but, um, but it, it expanded the franchise to, uh, to many of the millions of African Americans that had been free from, free from slavery. Um, at the same time, the constitutional amendments aren't self-executing, which means that just because you pass a constitutional amendment, it doesn't mean that everything changes on its own. They have to be enforced and laws have to be passed to enforce them. And a number of laws were passed immediately after these constitutional amendments um, took effect to make these promises of, of the American democracy real. Um, I'm gonna start a, a, a game in the next slide and it's called first and second. And the way the game goes is I wanna ask you guys for a particular uh, question. When was the first time that this happened in American history? And when was the second? And they're gonna be, there'll be a couple of the uh, questions where the answer may be a little more nuanced than that. Um, and if you're not aware of the first time this happened, if you could just throw in any time that you're aware of the, you know, the particular questioning happened, that would be very helpful as well. Okay, so the first question in first and second is, what was the first lawsuit filed to desegregate a public school? And, uh, and, and if you're, you know, don't, don't be shy, it's okay if, 
it's great if you get it right. It's okay if you, you, you don't, but if you know, if you're aware of any lawsuit that um, led to the desegregation of a public school, uh, feel free to put that in the chat. Okay, and uh, Michelle, I'm seeing here 1949, Tate Case, Brown v. Board, 1939, Mendes versus Westminster, Brown v. Board, uh, 1880s, Brown v. Board, Mendes versus Westminster, a few more Brown v. few of, of those all being repeated. Okay. Okay. No, thank you, everyone. Those are all great answers. However, oh, and then one person, one said Roberts for his daughter, 1849, Roberts for his daughter. That's Teresa. Well, Teresa got it right. <laughs> So thank you, Teresa. So the first case was Roberts versus City of Boston. And this is actually a children's book about that case. And um, this case was brought by the future Senator Charles Sumner. He was a, a lawyer at the time in Massachusetts, along with an African-American attorney named Robert Morris. And um, the case was brought, so this little girl who was four years old named Sarah Roberts, so she could go to her neighborhood school. And, um, and when she went to her neighborhood school, they, she was forced to leave because she was black and she was told you need to go to the black school that was further away and also of a, less, a lesser quality. And um, uh, future Senator uh, Charles Sumner brought this lawsuit to um, say that she should be allowed to go to school in her neighborhood, in her community. Um, unfortunately, the lawsuit was not successful, but the community rallied around and they were able to, um, to help her achieve her goals. Um, and that was, as someone said, all the way back in 1850, when that case was decided. Okay, uh, everyone here is familiar with the Brown v. Board of Education. And so this is a picture um, of, of uh, the little girl integrating the school in New Orleans uh, after the Brown v. Board decision was reached. And, um, and the Brown v. Board decision was reached 100 years after the Roberts versus City of Boston case in 1954. So you see the huge, a huge span of time has passed from when these arguments were first being made until when they're finally successful. And another thing that I'd like to point out is that um, Thurgood Marshall, who was the attorney, one of the attorneys on the Brown v. Board, Board case, um, used many of the same arguments that Charles Sumner had used in his case um, that said that, that segregation of schools and the separation of children by race, it doesn't just harm black children, but it also harms white children and that it poisons their mind and how they think about other, other people that are a part of humanity. And um, Thurgood Marshall used some of those same arguments when bringing Brown v. Board 100 years later. Okay, what is the first federal statute to prohibit uh, segregation um, in, in public places. And so these are just some pictures of signs that I think a lot of us are familiar with from the Jim Crow era that said, you know, black people had to use different water fountains from white people and different restrooms and um, all of that. So these are pictures from Jim Crow. What federal statute prohibited segregation in, in places open to the public? You're, you're muted, Deborah, if you're saying responses. I am seeing um, examples of both laws to in, uh, impose segregation. Um, so, but there's also, so there's Plessy versus Ferguson, but there's also seeing dates 1866, wasn't the first in New Orleans, Civil Rights Act of 1866, uh, uh, interstate commerce clause are some of the responses. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, first, the the statute I think most people are familiar with that ended the Jim Crow era um, in the present day is the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964. Um, so that's the one that is still on the books today. It's still in force today. But there was another statute that was almost identical 
to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and that was the 1875 Civil Rights Act. And again, this was a uh, brainchild of Charles Sumner, Senator Sumner from Massachusetts, um, and he worked really hard in introducing this bill into Congress year after year. It finally passed a couple of, um, a short time after he died. Um, and this law would have obviated the existence of Jim Crow America, except the Supreme Court struck it down in 1883 in a series of cases called the civil rights cases. And after they did that, um, states then you know, were able to um, implement so many of these Jim Crow uh, laws that allowed the entire um, you know, foundation of American society to be separated by race. And so I think it's just important to recognize that what, we're, what we've experienced in the slow progress to racial equality is not necessarily a natural evolution. It's not that, you know, Black people were enslaved, Black people were freed from slaves, and it took people 150 years to, to realize what the right thing was. People knew what the right thing was in the 1860s and the 1870s, and they did it, but America changed course. And that's what you know allowed the period of, of Jim Crow to exist. Um, I know we're running short on time. I have a, a lot, uh, several other examples like these, but I'm going to kind of fly through them quicker. And I'm and I'm just providing this context because I know you guys are all teachers. My book, um, Black Was the Ink covers this entire history. And so everything that's on these slides, and this is why I'm presenting it this way, um, your students, if you read my book, they're going to know these answers and they're going to understand this arc of history. Um, Another example, who was the first black governor of the United States? Um, I, I, if, you know, I could wait for answers. Maybe people are familiar with Deval Patrick. Maybe people are familiar with Doug Wilder. Um, maybe someone's familiar with PBS Pinchback, but he's actually the first black governor of a US state. Uh, he um, was not elected governor, but he filled the, the seat after the sitting governor of Louisiana resigned. Um, and so he became governor, uh, finishing the rest of that governor's term for about five weeks. And the next, the next time there was a black governor was 120 years later, and that was Governor Doug Wilder. Um, what's the first successful boycott of public transportation over segregation? Everyone's gonna think uh, most likely of Rosa Parks, who's amazing, and we've got the Montgomery bus boycott, but Robert Smalls, um, who was another uh, congressman in the Reconstruction era and has an absolutely fascinating history story from beginning to end, definitely encourage everyone to look him up if, you, if you're not familiar with him. Um, but he uh, decided to get off of a streetcar in Philadelphia when they asked him to move to a segregated section. And he refused. He said, I'll just walk where I'm going instead. And that ended up prompting a boycott of the Philadelphia streetcars that led to legislation to prohibit uh, segregation on Philadelphia streetcars. Um, and so similar tactics were used in the civil rights era uh, nearly 100 years later. Um, when's the first time more than five Black people served together in Congress? In Reconstruction. And, uh, and then when was, the, when was the next time after the Reconstruction era? Uh, again, you'll see that it's nearly 100 years later before Black people had any, you know, as a, as a single congressperson, you can't do much to represent your community. You really, you know, you need a, a critical mass. And so um, the first time that happened again after the Reconstruction era was only after the voting rights uh, of 1965 was passed. And then here's a fun one. Who's the first Black person to be nominated Vice President of the United States? So uh, any guesses there? <laughs> it was Frederick Douglass. And uh, there were plenty of other black people that were nominated in between Frederick Douglass and Kamala Harris, but I had to put her here since she was actually the first to be um, vice president. So it's a long history. And then I think the question goes to why this gap? Why, you know, why this huge gap? And, um, and you, you can't ignore the um, huge surge and campaign of domestic terrorism that was taking place in the Reconstruction era um, with the goal and aim of suppressing Black people's political participation and keeping them from the polls. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was terror, it was, it was murders, it was assassinations of political leaders, and, um, and all of that um, led to a um, 
led to black people's the suppression of their um their vote so that the people that began running the states a lot of them were former confederate soldiers and people that were sympathetic to white supremacy confederate clauses and um and and once black people were no longer represented in government they were able to pass changes to their state constitutions that um that really uh um, change the landscape so that it would be that much harder or impossible even for Black people to exercise their right to vote and have their interests represented in government. And so what you'll see is from 1901 um, all the way until the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, um, there was not a single Black person rep uh, elected to Congress from the South. And that's after a period where you had 15, um, 16 um, congressional representatives, including two United States senators in the 1870s alone. And so that's how effective um, this campaign of domestic terrorism was and how effective the changes to the laws were. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Justin, who's gonna do an exercise on using art as a literary tool. Um, so Michelle did a very great job um, sort of explaining that long period of history in a short period of time. And I know as educators, um, your role is to sort of synthesize and see what's the best way of getting information to your students. And so I just wanted to bring and introduce the idea of visual literacy, which is based sort of solely on the idea of interpreting images and the meaning behind them and how there are various different um, visual and artistic components that you may not think of, but are um, crucial both to um, art makers and people who present you images like um, directors and cinematographers and how those images um, are used to convey a message. And so I wanna say that um, composition is one of those ways that artists do that. Um, your composition is your um, sort of the canvas, so to say, that you work on. It's how you are presenting the image that could be um, a sculpture, that could be a painting, that could be um, a drawing, it could be a movie, any visual work of art. And within a composition, you have different tools to give different meaning to um, the images in your picture. So you'll have scale and you'll also have um, light as well. So um, Michelle was nice enough to give different examples of the different illustrations within the book. But if you saw um, in the previous slides, um, um, the senator that was presenting, that was an illustration that I did, I focused on um, centering the person, the senator, um, and making him the largest figure within the scene to give the idea of the power and the grandiose of the situation. And so just like um, different writers are being very meaningful with their syntax and word choice, know that anybody that is making an image um, is being just as thoughtful with both how they place um, the images or the components of the image in the picture and also how um, those images and how it's used are used to forward um, and push a larger idea. And so um, light is another thing that I um, use in my own artwork as, as an important tool. So again, previously in the presentation, there was the visual. And I think that was an example of how sort of after this terrible massacre, the light from a candlelight visual is very small, but still sort of like bright and flickering. And I think those ideas and themes come into play as the reader. And you get the idea of how even after these horrible massacres happened throughout the South, Black people um, still have this small flickering hope. And so as educators, when you have students reading picture books as early as early education, all the way up to high school students, you can express to them that images that they see possibly in books like Black Was the Ink, or if they're looking at the work of like Gordon Parks or any other um, Black artists, that there is meaning to how these images are being created. And so what I wanted to do, um, possibly since we're kind of running a little short, maybe in the back of your mind, there I took this caption from the book, um, which was on page 
240, and it's sort of at the end of the chapter. And it's a scene in which Malcolm is um, looking out after he was able to, um, I don't want to spoil the book, but achieve something that was very hard as far as um, racial justice. And I want you to sort of think about how are, how could you compose or how could you think about that scene in your head? Because as you're reading, um, and as you know, if you're you know, teaching um, phonics, there's encoding and decoding. Think about how you would in your head um, essentially create that scene and what are some certain ideas and some certain ways that you could depict um, sort of looking out in the water and sort of this reflective and sort of hopeful and happy feeling with um, images. And I think that's important with visual literacy because you will have students who are accessing the knowledge um, both by reading it, but you also want to have students access the knowledge visually because I think that will be more powerful as you get into more abstract concepts. And I would like to send it back to Michelle. Just unmute. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. That was great. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, so what are some what are some things that uh, we can do uh, additional ways to help? Uh, you know, emphasize this history. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is really important as a first step is just remembering it and, uh, you know, bringing it back into our collective consciousness. And so uh, something that I've been doing on my social media um, page is I've been doing what I call my fake Black was the Ink book tour. And what I've been doing is I've been going around town and I live in the DC area. And so I, um, and so much of the history uh, that is covered in this book takes place in DC. And so I went around to different historic sites um, that have ties to the reconstruction era and took pictures with Black was the Ink there. And so the first picture you see is in front of Senator Blanche Bruce's house, which is about a block from the convention center. Um, and so I, I was like, that's so ironic. I never knew his house was there. And for anyone who's ever participated in Congressional Black Caucus um, uh, weekend, that takes place right at the convention center, literally steps from his house. And I just wonder how many of us even realize that the first Black person to serve a full term as a senator, as a United States senator, his home is steps away from where all these Black legislators come together every single year to talk about um, their priorities um, for, for, for legislating. Um, the, uh, the second picture is the back image from my fake book tour where I keep a running list of all the different sites that I've visited. And, um, and what you see the black and white photo there is a picture of something called Freedman's Savings Bank. And it was a bank that was established by Congress for African Americans um, after the Civil War as a safe place for them to deposit their money. Um, but there's a whole very sad story about how um, the original charter of the bank was modified to allow the board members to basically uh, just use the bank as their, their personal piggy bank and they bankrupted the bank and all of these hundreds of thousands of black people lost millions in savings and um, because the bank was chartered by Congress they kept uh, petitioning Congress to reimburse them for their loss, but they largely, most people never, you know, became whole uh, again. Um, and the third picture is uh, uh, called the Wormley Hotel. And if anyone has ever been to Joe's, um, what's it called? Joe's Steak and Crab. Um, what's, I'm trying to think, what's Joe's Steak and, it's not Joe's Crab Shack, but it's Joe's Crab House. It's the fancy one right around the corner from the White House on 15th Street, uh, right around like 15th and H. Um, that was originally the site of a place called the Wormley Hotel, which was a black owned hotel and restaurant. And this is actually a placard that's on the corner. And so some of these things are hidden in plain sight. Uh, a lot of people just don't know that they're there, but they, many of them are marked. Um, but this was a black owned hotel and restaurant directly across the street from the White House. And it was one of the finest establishments in Washington, DC in the 1870s. And that was just mind boggling to me. Um, it also is likely the site of where the hayes tilden compromise was struck, which if, if folks are familiar with that compromise, that was um, the agreement that was reached um, when there was a disputed presidential election in 1876 that gave the presidency to uh, Rutherford 
Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes um, on the condition that federal troops would be withdrawn from the South and the federal troops in the South was the only thing providing protection to the African-Americans there from all the domestic terrorism that they were experiencing. And so with the withdrawal of those federal troops, reconstruction effectively ended in the South. And so very ironic that that deal was struck at the site of a, a black man's hotel um, that only existed because of the opportunities that came from reconstruction. Uh, and so, you know, I just wanted to, you know, point out that all of these things I'm talking about, none of it's new. And so I just kind of hearken back to some of these same themes that have echoed in history by different people. We have Frederick Douglass uh, talking, uh, you know, giving his speech, what to the slave, what to the American slave is your 4th of July and feeling like the promise of, of you know, the best of America was a mockery to him as an enslaved person. Um, and then we have Langston Hughes, um, who wrote so many beautiful poetry and patriotic poetry. Uh, I think it's patriotic because it's really asking America to live up to its founding principles. And so uh, one of my favorite poems by him is, oh, let America be America again, the land um, that never has been must be. And then also we have, um, you know, Martin Luther King giving so many amazing speeches um, with, with emphasizing these things, same things as well. Um, I do want to quickly point out that there is a teacher's guide for Black Was the Ink. Uh, that's the link for it. It's on my publisher's website, Lee and Low Books. And as I'm sure all of you guys know, the Zen Ed Project has so many amazing uh, resources on how to teach about the Reconstruction era. And they just released their report last week on how state standards fail to teach the truth about Reconstruction. And so you guys, um, I'm counting on you to change that. <laughs> and so we can we finally really start teaching this era and, and all of its importance in American history um, and giving it the attention that it deserves. Um, that's my contact info. Um, Justin, I'm sorry, I don't have your contact info on here, but would you add it to the chat, Justin, um, your website? And sure. if there's any you know, way that you want people to follow you, um, and that's it. We there's only like maybe a minute left. Does anyone have any questions? And I'll look for the chat for questions. I'll also note that someone's asking for the teaching guide. We will send all the links that Michelle and Justin have been sharing and participants uh, in a follow up email to everybody. And they're on the Lee and Low website, which has fabulous books. Um, and let's see. Uh, and we've had really Howard University well represented in the house. Yay, wanna... HU. Yes, HU. <laughs> and Nova's gonna come visit from Texas when she's here. Um, anybody wanna unmute and ask a question? And I'm gonna turn off the recording for that. <laughs> 